over to you, Dr. Clemma Lewis. And thank you all for joining us. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Fox. So welcome and thanks for coming to the forum, which is a joint venture between Delta Sigma Theta St. Croix Alumni Chapter and the St. Croix, the VIA St. Croix Election Committee. Um, I want to just start with just giving you a little information about the sorority, because I think most people are misconceived about what sororities are all about, and they think they're a little cult, but it's really not about that. Uh, we were founded in 1913, uh, a private nonprofit organization whose purpose is to provide assistance and support through programs in local communities throughout the world. Our focus is on public service through five programmatic thrusts, including political awareness, which is what we're doing now in involvement, St. Croix alumni has worked tirelessly to support those efforts for the past 49 years. I'm happy to say next year we'll be celebrating 50 years of community services to the St. Croix community. The Social Action Committee implements the chapter political awareness and environment thrust. It develops program to increase the knowledge of current issues that the community is informed and promote social activism, target advocacy, and ongoing education, specific to current and evolving local, state, national, and international issues. Most recently, through the efforts of the Social Action Committee, St. Croix Lambda Chapter was selected as the 2023 International Recipient Ch Chapter for our excellent award, our excellent work in social action in our committee. This is a recognition of a chapter. And what made it so exciting was we were recognized because the forums that we took out on anti-gun violence. So we're constantly in the community having activities in the community. The 2024 election forum is one of the chapter's ongoing initiative and election. Next Saturday, October the 5th, we will host a voter's registration from 12 to 3 at Cost You Less. Fortitude on the front line is our theme this year for 2024. It's the social action theme for this election season. As this theme implies, we have positioned ourselves intentionally on the front line with fortitude as we engage the community by registering, educating, and mobilizing the right to vote. Please let me make it clear to all the candidates that's here, we do not promote any particular candidate. We don't promote any particular party. We are nonpartisan. Our role here today is to give the candidates that's running a forum to show the community what you got, to let the community know what your platform is and what you're willing to offer them. It has nothing to do with Delta agenda. It's going to be your agenda. So I would like the following candidates to come up. We have two panels because we had quite a few people that registered. And I think Dr. Fox mentioned it. I'll reiterate. These are people who pre-registered. That's why they're on the panel. I'll start with Senator uh, Samuel Carrion. Would you please come up and take a seat when your name is called on the stage? Senator Maurice James. Mr. Norman Baptiste. Baptiste. Mr. Baptiste, I think I saw him. Okay. Clifford Joseph. Former Senator Kurt Violet. Please come up. We got two tables, so don't feel left out. So we doing four here and four here. Mr. Rupert Ross Jr., I know I saw him. Please come up. Sheila Scullion, please come up. I know I saw Sheila too. Michael Joseph, please come forward. Mr. Ronald Pickhart, please come forward. And that's it for this panel. We do have a second panel with the second set of candidates. And make sure everybody got space. We have enough chairs. You want to sit there, Michael? You want to sit right there? You good? Wherever you're comfortable. Yeah, if you sit there. That's more comfortable. Oh, it's not enough. 
Well, he's the only delegate. Let him stay. You, you want to sit? You can sit with me, Mr. Pickard, if you're okay with that. Because so, you're the only delegate that's here. So I don't, I don't think we should make you wait. Okay? Yeah. That way, um, if he wants to leave, he can leave. I don't think that will do that. Okay? You good? Okay. So I just introduced the candidates that's running. I will, as we go along, I'll introduce what position they're running from. Before I do that, I would like to go over the rules so everybody will be clear. And I, I forgot something. My name is Dr. Clem S. Lewis. I am your moderator for the day, and I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, St. Croix Lumda Chapter Social Action Committee, and we're all about the community. The questions we have engaged is all about the community today. But I would like to start with the rules because we want to be fair and open, and I'm asking all candidates to listen to rules and please respect them. My understanding from Dr. Foster rules were sent to you, but I'm going to read them again. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority is a private, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. The hosting of this forum is by the St. Croix Alumni Incorporated status to support, and we do not support or endorse, endorse any political candidate. We're not here to support or endorse. Also, can I make it clear, this is not a debate. So this is not for candidates to get up here and talk about each other or debate. This is about showing who you are. This is a forum, not a debate. Can all candidates in agreement? It's all about who you are. We're not debating anybody up here today. All right, thank you. Number two, all the candidates have already at RSVP. That's why they're here on the stage. If they have an RSVP in advance, they won't be allowed to participate today. There will be two panels, panel A and panel B. Panel A is already up here. We actually had 17 people that registered, so we split it up eight by eight and we just found out one person can't make it. The panel composition will determine the, the, uh, the form on when they would come in. On the panel, the candidates will be seated in alphabetical order, supposedly, but we didn't do that. We'll let that slide. At the conclusion of the panel, we would bring on the other candidates. Each candidate has the opportunity to provide a 60-second opening statement. Is there a mic on your table? I saw one over here. Okay, so you'll share the mic. So the candidates have a 60-second opening where they would give you an opening, and at the end of my questioning period, they will have a 60-second closing as well. During the, questions and, uh, during the questions and answering segment, each candidate will receive the same amount of time to speak. We are not discriminate. Each candidate will receive two minutes to respond to a particular question. If there's a follow-up question provided by the moderator, they will be given an extra 30 seconds. It is within the candidate's discretion to decide if they want to use all their time or some of their time. That's totally up to the candidate. The moderator asks the questions, maintain the control, and will ask you to stop speaking when the timekeeper say your time is up. When your time is up, please don't keep talking. Please be respectful and stop. And the timekeepers that's in front of us, my two sorors, they will show you a card and they will let you know when you got 30 seconds left to kind of help you out, okay? So we thought that would be helpful. The timekeepers will provide three signals regarding the indication. Time signal, can y'all show them as I speak? The green signal card, this signal will be used to indicate, indicate it's time for you to start. The yellow will be used when there are 30 seconds left, and she will also tell you there are 30 seconds left. The red means your time is up. Stop. Okay? <laughs> All right. The purpose of the forum is to provide an opportunity for the public to learn about the candidates. This is a, it is not an open for the public to ask you questions. This is your time to show yourself and who you are. And we also live streaming so people be able to watch and pay attention and learn from you. Candidates must not disrupt each other. We will not speak over each other, as I said earlier. This is all about the community. This is all about us being respectful. And this is really all about us, about you showing us who you are so that we can make the right choice when we go to the ballot. Fair enough? 
On that note, I would like to welcome you all to the panel. So what I'm going to do, we have composed questions from our sorority as well as from members of the community that we thought would be the most impactful, okay, that we got from the community as well. And the questions are set up where I have questions for the Senate candidates, I have questions for the Constitution Convention, we made sure we broke it down, we have questions for the delegate as well, and we have questions for the Board of Election and the Board of Education. So the questions have been broken down according to your position, okay? So we, of course, we're going to start, not of course, but we're going to start with the senatorial candidates. So since he's the first on my list, I'm going to start with Ms. Senator Carry On with the first question. Senator Carry On, give him the mic, please. You re ready for your question? Okay. Yeah. Oh, the introduction, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting that you gotta do your introduction before the question. My bad. You can do your introduction first, I'm sorry. Thank you, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Samuel Carrion, I'm number six on the ballot, and I'm here once again asking for your vote and support for this 36th uh, legislature of the U.S. Virgin Islands. I'm honored to have been able to serve and represent you in the 34th and the 35th, and I'm looking forward to continue to support and represent my people in my district here on St. Croix in the 36th legislature of Virgin Islands. I've been a longtime community activist and advocate for our people. I've served various nonprofit organizations as the Sexual Assault Domestic Council and many others, the American Red Cross and many others. I've also been a manager and director of the American Red Cross, so I have a background in nonprofit organization. I've also a small business owner, so I understand the struggles of the small business community. I'm a father of four children who went through and are in our public education system, so I understand, and I'm asking for your support, number six on the ballot. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John. Uh, I am Maurice James. I am a first-term senator in the 35th legislature. I was born in St. Croix. I went to Catholic school in St. Croix, um, graduated from St. Joseph, and then went to George Washington University with the intention of becoming a doctor like my father, Dr. Randall James, but came home and during the time that I was home, I taught physical science at the Elena Christian Junior High School and the St. Gray Central High School. And then I went to work at the Division of Tourism. It wasn't a department at the time. And um, left that after a few years and went to school, law school at the University of Maryland School of Law. Came back home and worked in the private, nonprofit, and military sector. I was a JAG at the Virgin Islands National Guard for, well, 20, 2001 to... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm good at following instructions, you know, so that's what happens when you say time. I actually stop. Thank you for your vote, number 20. Blessing. Blessing, 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 blessing. Norman, Norman Bapo John Baptiste is the name. Bapo stands for better at political office, which reminds me that the people of St. Croix deserve better political representation. The number 13, the one reminds me that God Almighty comes first, number one. Number three reminds me of the three emanations of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I bring to the table the experience knowledge and wisdom of having been a, or that I am a retired educator, a former senator, and a current talk, talk show host. I believe that all of our problems rest with either the miseducation, the undereducation, or the lack of education of our people. I want to help transform the education landscape so that our people can be empowered and become successful. And I think that can begin, that push can begin at the legislature. So therefore, I'm asking you, Help me make the difference in terms of establishing the difference between power 
which comes from knowledge, and enlightenment, which comes from education. Thank you, John Baptist, number 13. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Michael Antonio Joseph Esquire. I am. I was recruited to the Board of Election. I never sought the office, but I was written in with a request. I believe that the ability to vote is not effective unless the election system is credible, is uh, people believe in it, and 40 to 50 percent of elections go by without vote, um, registered voters not voting. I want to change that. And therefore, I believe you vote when you think your vote has value. If you don't think it has value, you will not go to vote. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Board of Elections. Thank you for Delta Sorority for putting on this forum here today. Thank you very much. My name is Ronald Picard. I'm number one on your ballot. I am running for the office of delegate to Congress. When the time comes and the questions are asked, I will tell you exactly what is my strategy. Make a long story short, my job is to make sure I get that money from Congress and make sure the money goes exactly where it's supposed to go. And the only person to get that job done is Ronald Pickard. We need to make sure our vendors are paid so that the services can open back up again. And this is what we're lacking right now as we're speaking. So I humbly ask you today on November 5th for early voting to vote for number one, Ronald Picard on your ballot. And once again, my job is to make sure I work with all parties, the Democratic Party, the Independents, the ICMs, as well as the Republicans. Because at the beginning and the end of the day, when you wake up and you go to sleep, we're all Virgin Islanders. And we want the best for the Virgin Islands. And I'm here to make sure I get it done. You heard what they said, it's going to take an act of Congress. Good afternoon, my name is Clifford Joseph, candidate number 20, sorry, candidate number 18 on the ballot. <laughs> anyway, born and raised here on St. Croix, went to public school, raised up in Montbijou, some are Christian said as well, graduated from Central High School, worked for the telephone company, While working at the telephone company, I had an opportunity to become uh, uh, organizer for the Steel Workers Union. So I work as an organizer. Went over to the fire department, spent 27 years there as a uh, union again, because I'm always about people, for people, all the time. So Clifford Joseph, number two. I'm a small business owner as well. I made it through the ranks in the fire service from firefighter, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, fire marshal, and under the MAP administration, I was given the opportunity to be the director. Thank you again. Good day to St. Croix. Good day, St. Croix. I first want to begin by thanking the Board of Elections and Deltas for having this forum. It's a, a unique <laughs> juncture that they're, they're in, undertaking today. But I want to introduce myself. My name is Cord Vela. I'm number three on the ballot. I have a bachelor's degree from the University of the Virgin Islands in mathematics. I have a master's degree in administration and supervision in education uh, from the University of the Virgin Islands. I was a teacher, an assistant principal, a principal for some 28 years in the Virgin Islands public school system. I then went on to become a senator, served in the 31st, 32nd, 33rd, and 34th legislature served one term as the chair of the Health, Hospital, and Human Services Committee, and then served three consecutive terms as the chair of the Finance Committee, where I'm proud to say that about four of those years, we had a balanced budget where our projections literally match our expenditures. So I, I, I take um, great pride in that. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sheila, Sheila Scullion, and I will be uh, running in the Constitutional Convention. I'm number five. Um, I feel very deeply that the next 10 years are critical for the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, and I feel that there needs to be a very serious focus on health care. We are scheduled to have a brand new hospital on St. Croix and a new hospital um, over on St. Thomas. And uh, there, has, there has been a, a tremendous neglect um, in the mental health system and also providing decent housing and a 24-7 staff supervision for the homeless population. I think uh, with the cooperative spirit, we can actually get this accomplished in the next 10 years, and I will work every day for you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rupert Ross, Jr. I'm number 10 on the ballot for the Sixth Constitutional Convention. Some of you may know me as an educator, former principal of St. Croix Central High School. As I look around at the panel, this one and the one to follow, I'm proud to say that more than half of the panels, panelists are graduates with a diploma with my signature. Some of you may know me as a Rotarian, been doing community service work. Some of you may know me as a sports participant uh, in the racing commission, baseball activity, basketball activity, Olympic committee. But some of you may not know, remember, that I was also a member of the third and fourth constitutional convention. I was the president of the fourth constitutional convention. I participated in the two status commissions representing the people of Virgin Islands in Washington, D.C. And thank you. Okay. I think we got everybody introduction. Okay. So, Tam, keep us um, so that you don't throw the candidates off with just stopping them. Please give them 30 seconds. Tell them they got 30 seconds so they can wind it down because they were kind of caught off guard. Okay? Yeah, Let's go with the first okay. questions. We're going to start with the senatorial candidate. Uh, we're going to start down here with uh, Carrion. Yeah, we're going to start. We're going to start with Senator Carrion. So, Senator Carrion, you got the mic. You ready? Okay. Timekeepers, y'all ready? Okay. First question: What would you do? What would be your first piece of legislation when you go into the next, if you are elected, to go into the next Senate? What would be your first piece of legislation? Well, I have various legislations that are still pending that I'm working on because I'm a sitting senator. But one that I want to be able to introduce is the public, um, public building authority. And the public building authority, what it does is really concentrate individuals that are skilled, electrician, plumbers, masoners, carpenters, under one umbrella, like how we had public work before. Because one of the problems we've been seeing is that our government buildings have been year after year deteriorating, and the government has been leaving our buildings to then go out and rent and abandoning our buildings. And the reason for that is because we haven't been maintaining our buildings, we haven't had a line item for maintenance, and we don't have skilled individuals that we could pull from to provide the maintenance that is necessary. Necessary. We have different departments that have one person might have an electrician, another department might have a plumber, but you can pull the one that is in another department. By having them under one umbrella, under one roof, you could have task orders, skill service individuals that can go out and really maintain and do the repairs that we need. So that authority will be concentrating in contracts, everything to do with construction, development, and maintenance of our buildings in the territory. By doing that, we're going to um, do good with regards to our resources, human resources, because then we won't have to give out so many contracts out, and we'll be using our skill sets that we have, skill force that we have within the government, and we will also be able to also save with um, financial resources. So that's one of the uh, legislations that I will be introducing as I come into seconds. the legislature, because we cannot continue to rent out and have our public buildings in the condition that they are. It's time that we pay attention to what we have. We are good stewards of the properties that we have, and we maintain them so that we could save money and continue then to provide services to our community that so much is served. Thank you. Samuel Carrion, number six on the ballot.
Senator James. Ready? Senator James, how would you legislate to ensure the stability of public education in our system? What would you do to ensure the st stability of public education in our system? Thank you. I really don't understand the question about to ensure the stability of public education because right now we have a system in place, an educational system. What really happens, I believe, that my focus is on is that the area we have neglected is early childhood education. By the time children reach to school at the age of four or five, their brain has already developed 90% and they come to school unprepared. And that's why we're having children who are left behind. So I would create, and I think this would lend to the stability that the, the person who authored the question may want, which is once you create an early childhood system and you coordinate the departments of education, um, human services, and health, and so that they no longer exist in silos and they're coordinated, you make sure that the whole child is addressed. So by the time that child gets to um, first grade, they're prepared. In addition to that, to improve the stability, we need to also increase parental engagement. Right now, the parents don't know the power they have, and they can in fact contribute to the change and improve the stability that we need. But until parents really realize the power and become invested in their children, and until we as a society realize that children need to be held from seconds. birth, then we're not going to be able to change what's happening in the lives of our people. Because you can actually look at the lack of education in those early years and actually tell whether someone is going to be incarcerated, pregnant, homeless, without housing security before they even graduate from school. So that is where I would focus, on a early childhood education system, and that in itself would lend Time. stability to the entire system. Vote number 20. Thank you, Maurice James. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Baptiste, you ready for the next question? Okay. The cost of living in the Virgin Islands is relatively high due to a variety of factors. Whether it's the cost of our utility bills, the cost of food, the cost of Medicare and medical care and et cetera, what legislature steps, what legislative steps do you think would address some of those issues? Thanks for the question. Um, I'm not an expert, but I'm going to offer an opinion. I think that we first of all have to employ the assistance of people who are experts in the area of economic development and other related industries, bring them to the table and find out how we can craft legislation to address the cause, the sources of the increased cost of living that our people experience. And then we need to have that legislation get specifically towards certain targets so we can, we can put remedial steps in place. That's about, I cannot come here and make believe that I am such an expert that I know exactly what to do, but I'm gonna rely on enlisting the support, the assistance, the advice of those who know better than I do and craft legislation to address our cost of living problems here in the territory. Thank you, John Baptiste, number 13, on the ballot. Thank you. Mr. Joseph, Michael Joseph, you're next. You're running for the Board of Election? Yes. Your question is, what is a new rule, regulation, or instruction that you would implement during your term that would improve the election system or be for the benefit for those that need to vote? What would you improve to improve the election system uh, in your first, next term? That <clears throat> students, especially young students, be primed, that is, the uh, supervisor of election board members go to the school and let the young people know what we are doing here today. I don't see 
uh, young and young students. We should also have um, mock elections. We do, I remember we used to have mock elections, but they should be prepared. And that's my answer. Uh, the young students knowing that elections are extremely important. Thank you. Mr. Picard, oh. running for delegate to Congress. You ready for your question? Get a mic, please pass him the mic. Your question. If you were elected as delegate to Congress, you would be able to introduce bills and resolutions on the floor of the House, but you cannot vote on the House floor. What are some steps you would take to ensure that the Virgin Islands legislative efforts in Congress are successful? Well, first of all, like you said, we have to realize something. The delegate at Congress is a non-voting position, so that, which is a handicap. So now you have to rectify that handicap. And by doing that, you have to offer your humblest respect. You have to be able to work with both parties, be bipartisan. And by doing that also, what you need to do is to join subcommittees and committees, and then introduce different bills that will go before the floor with the hopes that it will be being passed. But you stand a better chance of it getting passed when you're bipartisan. It makes no sense to attack a particular party because at the beginning and the end of the day, you're gonna need that party to pass both house. We're talking about a house or we're talking about a Senate. We're talking about a guest speaker. So you have to use the socialization in order to get things done. My thing is to work with the legislator, of course, when these bills are passed, where monies are acts. Uh, my position as delegate of Congress is to bring money or rather to quest, request money from Congress. But in order for it to go where it's supposed to go, I plan to work with a legislator to make sure that every penny of that money is accounted for. And by doing that, there's only one way to do that, which is to conduct a forensic audit to make sure the money goes where it's supposed to go. If I get $5 million that's supposed to go to the Department of Health, $5 million is going there, not $1 million. If I get $10 million to go to a Board of Education, $10 million is going to go to the Board of Education. But the only way to make sure that the money goes where it's supposed to go seconds. is to hold them accountable for their actions. That's my major part. And also, I will be using the weaponization committee. The weaponization committee is over the FBI, is over the executive branch, and is over major brands. I will use their assistance in asking me to conduct and to see that this forensic audit is conducted. The major difference is between an audit and a forensic audit, ladies and gentlemen, an audit is just a record keeping. A Time. forensic audit is a prosecutional audit, and that's what I plan to do. Time. Ron Picard, number one in your ballot. Thank you. We'll next have uh, Mr. Joseph, Clifford Joseph, senatorial candidate. Your question is, you ready? Yeah. Gun violence continue to remain prevalent issue in our community. What is one legislature step you would take to curb the existence or have an impact on violence in this community? Good afternoon again, Clifford Joseph, number 18 on the ballot. Gun violence, it's clear. We don't have any factories here that produces guns. That's number one. So the question would be, they have to be coming in via air or via water. So we have federal partners. We need to make sure that we beef up those partnership and make sure that um, the accountability for what's coming in is being checked. And we need to spend some time going back to education because education is a, a big part of the violence that we're seeing. If we Take time and make sure that our children learn from, I mean, home you can learn to love, but when you get to school, be able to take out the love. I remember, since we were speaking about education, they used to like to tell us, sticks and stone could break your bone and words could never hurt you. The thing is, they never end the story to let us know from who the words are coming from. So when you take your time and you raise your child, to send them to school, and they decide to follow a company. The company 
if, if, if they were learn, if they stayed in a learning environment that was not conducive to a violent environment, 30 seconds. it would have been more acceptable for them to understand the importance of life. I think half of our debts today, the young people doesn't understand the importance of living, and when they commit these crimes, the amount of pain they leave behind for the individuals that live on in the parents. Again, number 18 on your ballot, Clifford A. Joseph. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Our next senator, candidate, uh, candidate former Senator Kurt Violet. What is one measure which you support to increase revenues for the territory and why? Thank you for that question. <clears throat> I've been thinking about how we can grow the economy because the Virgin Islands have lost some 20,000 people, persons, as indicated by the last census, which was 2020. By this point now, you can literally say we have probably lost 28,000 individuals from the Virgin Islands. We cannot grow the Virgin Islands if we don't attract individuals to come back home and once again regain that population. The tax base has been eroded by those middle class individuals who have left the island. So one of the first measures that I would um, propose is to be able to incentivize the Economic Development Authority by giving them a sum of between $500,000 to a million dollars to go and recruit companies to come to the Virgin Islands. There's a big push now for Made in America. So this is a ripe time for us to be able to go out and be able to display the economic benefits that the EDA has to offer to companies and look at a niche market and be able to bring them here for some type of summit for that particular market. And the area I'm thinking about is pharmaceuticals. St. Croix was once an area that had pharmaceutical companies throughout the island. We saw the issues with pharmaceuticals during COVID and not enough medicine that was made in the United States. Why can't we market the Virgin Islands as that destination that would be able to bring those pharmaceutical companies back to the Virgin Islands made in America and be able to provide a stable line or a seconds. stable source of that particular product. We also have to, to look at the tourism industry, uh, which is booming on St. Damas, but not booming on St. Croix. How are we going to be able to attract hotels to be built in St. Croix? I did pass legislation, the Hotel Development Act, that is an incentive for hotels to be able to build in St. Croix and then they receive, receive a tax rebate but I don't know how aggressively they're marketing, marketing that legislation. And one of the issues that we have is that the Senate passed a lot of stuff, Time. but the administration need to enforce what has been passed. Kurt Vela, number three. Thank you, Mr. Vele. <laughs> Ms. Scullion is next, Ms. Sheila Scullion. You ready for your question? Your question is, how would you describe the state of the medical care in the territory? And how would you improve it if you could, as a senatorial candidate? No, she's running for the Constitutional Convention. Oh, you're running for delegate? A constitutional Convention. Oh, I'm sorry. We, I had you for a second. You're running for delegate, so I'm sorry. Ignore that one. I like that question, though. That was a good question. Not delegate to con Congress. You're running to Constitution Convention. OK, so let me ask you the first question for that one. Are you in favor of adopting a new constitution? using the fifth constitutional draft or making the revised organic act as part of the territorial constitution. You want me to repeat it or you? No, I think I got that. Okay. Um, I, I am Sheila Scullion, um, number five for the constitutional convention. And just so that everybody's familiar with this, um, all of the states have their own constitution as well as the federal constitution but the Virgin Islands does not have a constitution yet. So you would be electing a group of people to develop a document that would do something unique for the Virgin Islands. So if there were ideas from the public or ideas from the Senate where you wanted to do something very unique for the Virgin Islands, this would be an opportunity to do that. I am in favor of a constitution because the document has to be passed by the people. And I know there's been a lot of conflict, um, that's normal, but I think 
if we re review the last constitution, I think there are nine points in that constitution, and add anything that is really unique for the Virgin Islands that would help the Virgin Islands, that perhaps the people would vote yes. It does have to go to the governor, the Congress, and the president, but then the people vote as well. Uh, with respect to the Organic Act, I think it's just the senators that pull, the, pull that through in terms of 30 amendments. seconds. So this is Sheila number five for the Constitutional Convention. Thank you, Ms. Collier. Mr. Ross, we pass the mic to him. So Mr. Ross, Rupert Ross, following the Fifth Constitution Convention, the Department of Justice had several objections to the Constitution that was sent for approval. One objection was provisions conferring legal advantages on certain groups by ancestry. Do you agree with the Department of Justice assessment? Or would you suggest something else? Yes, the board question. <laughs> OK. The, I'm Rupert Ross, number 10, on the ballot for the Sixth Constitutional Convention. The issue as identified by the Justice Department of the Sixth Constitutional Convention in that it did not provide equal opportunity for all the residents of the territory to be equally protected under the Constitution. Uh, providing individuals with special rights over others is not the way to, to build a society. The, the, the reason why I would support the a Constitution for the territory is because over the years we have written the Constitution. Um, most individuals believe that the provisions of elected governor and the, the power of the legislature to have a veto override and to float bonds for public and private ventures and to be, have a Supreme Court and that came from, from the federal government. They basically came from constitutional initiatives of this territory uh, going to Congress and lobbying and asking the Congress to grant us all of these privileges that did not exist in 1954, among others, uh, uh, in the original Organic Act. So I take the position that, in fact, over the past years, since 19, the first Constitutional Convention, uh, the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth, we have written, except the fifth, by the way, we have written a Constitution. And the Sixth Constitutional Convention, from where I sit, has a commitment to take a look at what was done, put it all together in one document, the document, the laws that we are currently living under, and ask the people of the Virgin Islands to approve it. And that is my platform, and that is why I'm running for the Constitutional Convention. Time. Stand on the ballot. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Let's go back over to uh, Senator Carrion. Your question is, what is the most significant achievement you've achieved, you have achieved in this current legislation? What can you say you have achieved currently in the legislature? The one most significant, just one good one. Well, it's, it's, sometimes it's difficult. This is Samuel Carrion, number six on the ballot. Okay. Sometimes it's difficult to be able to pinpoint on one because they all have their level of impact in the sector in our community and affect the quality of life in that area. Um, but looking back and trying to think on one that might have been impactful, I think I was privileged enough to have been part of uh, the mental health, the Comprehensive Mental Health Act, along with Senator Francis and some of other my colleagues. And I think that was so crucial and important because that's an area within our community that we're lacking. And we know that we have a great need in the mental health field. And unfortunately, we don't have within the territory the infrastructure, we didn't have the infrastructure in place and the professionals in that field to provide that assistance. If we talk about all the, all the other areas that are affecting us, for example, the economy, problem, problems within our uh, Department of Education, problems within our economy, problems within small business, problems within gun violence, everything that we come in contact with have an effect on our mental health. So if we don't address our mental health issue, everything else then 
is in vain. So I think that one of the most important legislations that we were able to pass, along with my colleagues, because it's important to recognize that not one senator can move anything by itself. It's a collective effort. So that comprehensive mental health behavior act really, really is crucial. I think is one of the most important ones because it addressed a great need in our community. And we're successful enough now to pass through the Epson Agreement Settlement, $18 million to be able to now to build um, our mental health facility here on St. Croix. So we were able to pass uh, three million to be able to do the design, one million to establish the mobile van unit for mental health, and now 18 million, which we passed yesterday, to be able to build our mental health facility. So mental health is on its way here in St. Croix, and I'm very proud of being part Time. of that. Samuel Carrion, number six on the ballot. Thank you. Senator James, I'm going to ask you the same question, since you're also in the legislature. What would be your most significant achievement since you've been, I know you're a first-time senator, what, what would be your most significant achievement? Thank, thank you for that question. And yes, I am a first-time uh, senator, unlike the others um, in the Senate right now with their sixth, third, fourth, fifth um, times, and those um, other candidates. So. I feel really proud of the fact that I was able to get my colleagues to come on board with the Mobile Integrated Healthcare Act because that brings essential healthcare services to people directly in their homes. We still have to fund that program adequately because I would like to see it expanded to St. Thomas and St. John because if we're going to take care of people in their homes, it relieves the burden on the hospitals and the emergency rooms. I also was very, very happy to support Senator Donna Fred Gregory with the passage. I was a primary sponsor with her for the Bureau of School Construction and Maintenance because for years and years and years, we've heard about the schools not being repaired, not being maintained. That's not a brand new problem. That's a problem that has existed in this community for years. So with the creation of that entity, we're now able to have them focus on construction and repair and have the Department of Education focus on instruction where their focus should be. The biggest thing for me personally, coming from public housing, was the fact that without legislation, I was able to convince the seconds. governor to give every single eligible Williams Delight resident 15000 to purchase their homes. And that's very, very heartwarming for me, and one of the best things, because since 1995, the people of Williams Delight have been trying to get home ownership, and so I'm very proud of, of that. And pension benefits for veterans was increased. I supported my colleague, Senator Duane DeGraff, but as Senator Carrion Time. said, you can't do it alone. So I thank my colleagues. Vote number 20, Maurice James. Thank you. Thank you, Senator James. Mr. Baptiste? You ready for your question? So your question is, why should we trust you in seeking a position as senator? Why should we trust you? Norman John Baptiste, number 13 on the ballot. I am a spiritual, spiritually minded individual. I open by stating that I believe in the one mighty God, the three emanations that reflect the number 13 that I selected or chose as my number, I have experience as a former educator. I have wisdom as a former senator. I have additional expertise and insights into the problems of this community because I've been a talk show host for the past 10 years, hearing from the people what bothers them. Additionally, I'm the kind of person who's willing to reach across the aisles and work with other partners because we must have cooperation and collaboration. That's what I'm about. I'm a family man. I have my wife of 40 plus years and two children with her. I am grounded in this community. My home is in Enfield Green in this community. I pay my taxes here. I'm not like others who lost a seat and disappeared. I have never disappeared from this community. I've continued to maintain contact and to share with them and to be an activist in this community. I think with that and the wisdom that I have from the most high God and creator, without whom I cannot make any progress, I think I am aptly qualified to serve. Thank you again 
Norman John Baptiste, number 13, on the ballot. Thank you. Mr. Joseph, ready for your question? So, what would be your most significant uh, achievement in the election, on the election board? Because you've been on there before and you're running again. Can you tell us one of your achievements since you've been on the election board? Something that you've changed? Uh, re repeat what my achievement has been since I've been on the board. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Um, the realization mm -hmm. that the board members have to be conscious of statutory language. We recently had, still to my shocking awareness, that a critical word, inhabitant, was overlooked by the Attorney General and most of the members. And Ms. Fox was overruled when Ms. Fox says the candidate did not have the requisite inhabitancy to run for the delegate to Congress. I, and I call it a mutiny. The board has to become more literate, okay. literate with, with legal, um, with with legal the legality. jargon. Right. Uh, well, that's what we want to hear you say. We, we really want to not call names, because I started off, we, we, don't call, we don't call people names, and we're not talking about what people didn't, but I wanted to know what you did on the board, and you said you think you all feel need to know I, more I, I legal stuff. In, I was in shock. I'm still in shock. Okay. Um, I still have a minute. You still have a sub tap? You got 30 seconds. Thank you. Not to call names. I though. forgot to tell you, mm -hmm. I witnessed seven graders in Cuba mm -hmm. literally had a vote as to whether they're going to do ballet for athletics or soccer. And the group that won for soccer, they screamed their heart wasn't voting. Mm -hmm. So we should not take our children for granted. That's what we need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Thank you. Time. Okay. So candidates, I'm going to remind you, if you step over the boundaries, I'm going to stop you. We will not name, call, or put anybody down on the table. I want you to focus on you and what you're doing and your achievement. So delegate to Congress, my qu delegate uh, candidate, my question to you would be, uh, what do you see, what do you perceive, uh, what do you see, perceive that might be the most significant obstacle in you running for the position of delegate? Since this is your first run, do you see any obstacles at all in running? Absolutely not. I don't see any obstacle at all for me running for, I don't see any obstacle at all for me running for the position of delegate at Congress. Um, and, there, and there's a simple reason for that. It's because I'm bipartisan. Okay. I am here to work with every single party for the benefit of the people of the Virgin Islands. That's not the situation right now. That is not the case right now. Our present current delegate is only partisan. She's only working with one party. And that's the reason why in 10 years she introduced 114 bills and only one bill was ever passed. And that was in 2016 and it was passed by the Republican Party. Could you imagine how many more bills could have been passed to benefit the people of the Virgin Islands if in fact she was bipartisan? I mean, realistically speaking, you have the House and the Senate and you can brag about how much I passed the House, right? But Ms. Lewis, if I don't get the passage for the House and the Senate, the people of the Virgin Islands will never benefit with the, with the credentials that we have or could get. We're looking at We've been under 123 years, we've been under the insular restriction, and not one insular has ever been raised in 123 years. We're looking at a rum cover over, another situation. This a bill, well, most recently, the present delegate just introduced a bill last year, nine years. Pickard, this bill should have been introduced. Mr. Mr. Pickard, we're not discussing yes, other people. Absolutely. We want to stick to your abilities and your skills. You were doing good. Yes, ma'am. I like so all my, of, Continue on your track. You were good. 
Thank you very much. So my thing is to introduce bills that I know that has a high possibility seconds. of being passed right. so that we, the people of Virgin Islands, can pass it. You know, but in order for that to happen, and I cannot stress enough, you have to have a respectful relationship with all parties. It is the only way. Because if I attack you, Ms. Ms. Lewis, and let's say, for example, you're part of another party, and I'm constantly attacking you, when I introduce a bill, the likelihood of that bill being passed is never. We don't want that. The people of the Virgin Islands can no longer afford Time. to lose. Thank you, Ron Picard, we're number one in your ballot. Thank you, Mr. Picard. Thank you. So we'll go over to Mr. Joseph. Your question is, What do you perceive that might be a significant obstacle in you trying to run for senator, if you feel there are any obstacles in running for senator? Do you perceive any at all? No, I don't perceive any obstacle at all. It's a, it's a free market. Do you market. have any concerns about running? You feel like you can get in and you, you can be a team player and everything would be fine? Any of those kind of concerns? No, I... I don't, I, don't, I don't perceive any obstacle in running. Okay. I, don't, I don't perceive an obstacle in winning. Um, I'm a team-oriented person. I, I'm raised in a big family, so I know what it is to share. I know what it is to, to, to spread love. And uh, those, two, uh, th those two words are used, but we, we don't really show the action. Because um, I think if we are showing enough love, we wouldn't have had the same amount of killing that we have been around here. We would have been showing some love. Um, when we're talking about sharing, I think the most we keep saying to ourselves is um, we're resilient. We're resilient. But if you start to turn your head to the left and you start to turn your head to the right and you're looking around, the resiliency is breaking down because of selfishness. It's breaking to the point where you look at the street. We're having more mental folks walking around. Because, again, a lot of it is selfishness. If you look at monies that are supposed to have been put in our, um, our neighbors back in their homes, no way to be found on the roofs. They're found now, people being arrested or being charged. I'm just showing you that, again, all of this is selfishness. 30 seconds. Okay. So, in... Clifford Joseph, number 18 on the ballot, committed to serve. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Former Senator Violet, what was your most significant achievement when you were a senator? Or what would be your most significant achievement moving forward in the next legislature? Is there something particular you want to accomplish in the next legislature that you didn't get a chance to? Uh, I'll answer the first question first. What was the most significant achievement when I served? Okay. I would say many, um, but one that I'm very proud of is being able to ex expand programs at the University of the Virgin Islands, mm -hmm. being able to establish the Bachelor of Science in Nursing at the University, a Master's of Arts in, in, in Social Work at the University, being able to get the agriculture program going again. That was significant because mm -hmm. the St. Croix campus was literally lacking programs. And I plan to continue that expansion of the St. Croix uh, campus. I think that um, it, it was the 33rd legislature who were able to raise the minimum um, rate, the minimum wage from 725 to 1050. And that was significant for the people of the Virgin Islands who were also able to, to raise the minimum salary for government employees from 22,000 to 27,000. Uh, the last bill that I had in the legislature that failed it didn't fail in the legislature, it failed at Government House, was a proposal to raise the minimum salary from 27 to 32,000, was passed by 14 senators, it was vetoed um, by the governor, and the reason why I had the bill was that those individuals who received 27,000, somehow the union don't look out for them. Our school lunch workers, our custodians, it seemed like they have no representation and they're just stuck at that salary forever. So one of the first things I'll do in the 36th legislature, if elected, is to bring that bill back. It was only going to cost us about $4.4 .4 million, and it was going to affect over 1,100 employees. That money can be absorbed in the budget. And we need to give individuals a living wage. And it's very hard for those individuals that's making 27000 to pay the bills. And that goes to the inflation that we're 
experiencing right now, so I would ask my colleagues to support me on that initiative. I also passed a Hotel Development Act that was able to have Frenchman Reef and Ritz Carlton be able to redevelop and rebuild on St. Thomas, which brought about seven Time. to 800 jobs to that particular district. Court Vele, number three on the ballot. Thank you, Mr. Vele. Ms. Collier, I have this right this time, Constitution Convention. Question. Seven minutes left for this panel. Okay. Why should we trust you to represent us on the Constitution? Um, I think that I am a very trustworthy person. I keep my word. Um, I have vigilantly tried to do very good things for the Virgin Islands. I was successful in planting the seeds for the medical school in the Turnbull administration, and it took 18 years to develop that school. I really do think for St. Croix in particular that healthcare is really the gem to really help the island prosper. And we will have um, this medical school, a new nursing school, and hopefully I'm now working on an allied healthcare school through the years to really build this. Um, I also um, planted the seeds for the boardwalk on, on St. Croix through one of the senator's office, through his chief of staff. They liked the idea and they went with it. And I think that's a good addition, but there's so much work to do. I am really a 24 seven, 365 days person. And I think about the Virgin Islands every day. And so I really do feel I'm very trustworthy. Thank you for that, Ms. Gallagher. Mr. Ross, your question is very similar. Why should we trust that you're gonna go back in there and we're gonna finally get this constitution? Because we've been waiting for this constitution. How do we trust you're going to pull it through for us this time? Uh, because of what I said earlier, I believe we have written the constitution uh, over the years. Uh, we've, uh, piece by piece, we've convinced Congress that we're capable of uh, running a, a government, electing our officials, uh, having, we proceeded from the Fourth Constitutional Convention, of which I was the president, uh, we got the Congress to approve the document. It did not meet the muster of the people because of a, of a definition, uh, but that, it, that was a significant achievement. And once that Constitution was defeated by the people, uh, we still went back to Congress and got Congress to authorize the Supreme Court, which we now have. So, I take the position that I have the institutional knowledge, having been involved in the third, the fourth, having lived all my life in St. Croix and, and looked at the evolution of our government, how far our people have come, that I can be trusted to write a document for all the people of this territory. I would admonish my uh, fellow delegates to remember that we are constitutional delegates, not senatorial candidates. Uh, and part of the problem we've had in past constitutions is that people want to legislate from the constitution. And that's, that's not good. 30 uh, and seconds. And as a result of that, when you legislate, the document becomes uh, a divisive document and does not meet the mustard of all the people living under the document. Uh, Rupert Ross, number 10 on the ballot. Thank you, Mr. Ross, that was excellent. So we're gonna wind up now because we only have so many minutes, I'm coming. Everybody got one second to close, one, no, 30 seconds? 60 seconds, one minute to close, and we're gonna go back to Senator Carry On, and we're just gonna pass it so everybody get a chance to close out. Thank you. Uh, Samuel Carrion, number six on the ballot. Um, presenting myself once again, offering to serve and represent my people here in the District of St. Croix. Please consider me. You need to have a team of individuals that are uh, focused on the territory and to improve the quality of life for everyone in the territory. I've been able to move the legislations in various fields and area education. I was the author of expanding the part-time and online free tuition for our young people. I've also been able to work on
and initiatives that have to do with generating revenue, also with environment, the territorial state park system, also in the area of gun violence, the part component arm declaration act to ensure that uh, every part that a gun comes in is declared so that our streets could be safer. So in various fields have been effective during my term to be able to move legislation that would improve everything. I'm asking for your vote to support, to continue to represent you, to continue to advocate in your behalf, to fight for you. Samuel Sam Carrion, number six on the ballot. Progress for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Senator Carrion. Senator James. Thank you. First, I want to thank the organizations who um, conducted this today, the sorority, ARP. I, I love the fan. Of course, it helped. Um, the election system, and of course, Sunny Isle, because all of you came together to, to do this and to make our people aware. I want to first of all say that I love St. Croix. I love St. Croix people. I want to see St. Croix move. I want to see it improve. I worked hard during my first term. I'm still working hard. I have a number of bills that are pending. Um, it takes time for bills to pass. Um, I can tell you I have 20, 1,000 bills, but if I don't have the support of my colleagues, it's not gonna happen. So I believe that I collaborate, I coordinate, I cooperate. I have the skills, I am an attorney. I draft most of my bills. That's where my time is spent drafting bills. I also, of course, come up with creative ideas to improve the lives of our people, like I did with the residents of Williams Delight. Vote number 20, my island, my people, my concern, Maurice James. Thank you, Senator James. Mr. Baptiste, Mr. John Baptiste. Some statistics. 40% of our children are living below the poverty level. 89% of our seventh graders are failing in the area of mathematics. 78% of third graders failing in the area of language arts. And 75% of our high school graduates are required to take remedial courses when they enter UVI. I want to help fix that. I want to transform the education landscape so that every teacher can teach and every student will learn. And I think that can begin at the legislature. I'm asking for your support. Norman John Baptiste, number 13 on the ballot. Thank you and be blessed. Thank you, Mr. Baptiste. Mr. Joseph. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you to the sorority. I want you to know I don't lose. I, well, you can't win them all. But when you win 75%, what more you want? Mr. Ross. And I, as delegate to Congress, um, DeLugo's delegate to Congress draftsman, Mr. Ross and I got the fourth constitution passed unanimously by Congress. And then when it came home, the very criticism it got Congress looked at it and says, take it to court if you want. But we approve, um, Mr. Ross and I, Governor Farley, Governor DeLugo, and Time. Mr. Ross got, thank you, thank you, thank you. 31. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Board of Elections. Thank you, the Delta Sorority, for, for allowing me to give me the opportunity to speak to address the public. My name is Roland Picard, number one in the ballot. Uh, my job uh, as I run for delegate to Congress is to get the money so that we can open back up these services, get the money to make sure those who are in MMP can get surgery in the United States, we get the money to make sure we pay WAPA to make sure we have affordable and, and, and reliable energy, get the money to make sure that our children have a decent school to go to. So my whole thing is to get the money um, to help make sure the people of the Virgin Islands have a brighter future. But in order to do that, I will humbly require I need your vote in Congress. We need to do things the right way. A young lady once told me, she said, Mr. Pickard, you have my support. She says she'd rather give one chance to a thousand different people than to give a thousand chances to just one person. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ronald Picard, number one, uno, on your ballot. Thank you. Mr. Picard, you can put up. Um, 
Mr. Joseph next. This is your closing. Good afternoon again to everyone, and I thank the Delta fraternity and the Board of Election for having us here this afternoon for me to be able to express my views and answer questions that were sorted to me. My name is Clifford A. Joseph, number 20 on the ballot. I'm committed to serve. I'm trustworthy. My integrity is second to none. And I'm here to serve the people of my native land, which is St. Croix. And I want the people here in St. Croix also, myself and no, the seven, the 15 can't do it alone. We need your support, not just your vote. I need your vote now to get to the legislature, but we're going to be needing your support past being elected. Again, number, two, number 18 on your ballot, Clifford A. Joseph, committed to serve you. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. <laughs> Former Senator Ville. Thank you, Cordwell, and number three on the ballot, and I'm humbly asking for your vote. You know, this government of the Virgin Islands has literally 54 years, electing our first governor in 1970. We have always had challenging times, but now it's totally different. For the first time in the history of the Virgin Islands, we have access to a tremendous amount of cash. In 2014, when I was first elected on Senator Francis, the government was broke. We did everything to make sure we were able to sustain government, but now, we have access to $15 billion to transform this island educational system, healthcare system, infrastructure, and we have to spend those monies. We have $245 million in Envision funds that are going to expire in 2026 that was given to help homeowners to fix their roofs. So I am running because I want to make sure that we hold those parties accountable. We must hold them accountable for spending those monies and not sending back federal funds and then come in to the legislature to utilize general funds for what the federal government gave us to do. Vote court, Vele, number three on your ballot. Thank you, Mr. Vele. Ms. Scullion? Um, this is Sheila Scullion, number five for the Constitutional Convention. I do think that there is cause for optimism. And I do feel that there is, there is a possibility that if we really do the work, that it, within five and 10 years, we're going to see and feel the differences that everybody deserves. So please consider me for the Constitutional Convention. I'm going into it with humility, uh, with respect to all that's do been done before me. And with the help of God, we'll uh, do something good. Thank you. Mr. Ross. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Let me begin my remarks by having a disclaimer. I, I had nothing to do with uh, uh, candidate Joseph uh, support of my activities in the past. Um, I'd also like to thank this variety, uh, the Board of Elections, the business community, and those of you who are present for giving me this opportunity to, to share my thoughts with, with all of you. Uh, I am confident that the people of the Virgin Islands will, will uh, adopt a constitutional convention that will be the foundation for a better future for all Virgin Islanders. Whether they're born here, came here, or went here, or whatever the case may be, uh, we have a great society, a great team of leaders, both in and out of government, and we can do a, a tremendous job in showing the people of the Caribbean and the people of the world that this the Virgin Islands is second to none. Number 10 on the ballot, Rupert Ross. Thank you so much. So can we give all the candidates a round of applause? Thank you all for, so much for being here. You can now exit and we'll bring on the next panel. Thank you all so much. Well, Maxim, good afternoon. We will begin our second panel uh, this afternoon with our candidates above. Before we get started, I'll go over the rules again for the second panel in case they didn't hear. This is a nonpartisan um, forum. This Delta Sigma Theta is putting a forum on in conjunction with the VI Ele uh, Election Committee. 
we do not support candidates or, 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 or groups or political parties. We are neutral. We want to make that clear. We also want to make it clear why we are here, while you are speaking, you are not allowed to put down anybody else. There won't be no name calling. There won't be talking about any other people. Today, the forum is about you. We want you to tell the people who you are and what you have to offer. So we're asking you to focus. If you do proceed and proceed to add somebody in your conversation, I will politely cut you off because that's not what we're doing today. We're going to be respectful. All right, everybody, the right is right. And the forum, this is not a debate. This is about not putting anybody down. This is about letting those people that's watching you know that you are their candidates. Let them know what you got to offer. And that's what's going to help you, I think, today, letting everybody know what you have to offer. You have the timekeepers in front of you. They will be showing you cards. Uh, they will be showing you green first to start. Yellow, you got 30 seconds, and red to stop. They'll try to remember to tell you to have 30 seconds just to kind of help you keep up with the time. And then I will be asking the questions. We'll start from this end, and we'll go around, and we'll just do it in that order. Everybody, you will, I will be asking you some same questions and some different questions, but the questions will be based on the position you're running for as well, okay? All right, so I think we're ready to start. Thank you all for being here so we can begin. So let's begin with the first 60 seconds on introducing yourself. And let's start with you, Mr. Vera. Good afternoon, family. My name is Julian Vera, and I'm number 16 on your ballot. What do I bring to the Senate, the 36th legislature? I'm bringing a wealth of knowledge in a nonprofit organization. I'm bringing a wealth of knowledge, 35 years to be exact, as a small business owner here in the Virgin Islands. I'm also bringing about 20 years of government investigation, of good governance investigation from around the world, including the Virgin Islands. I've seen where the Virgin Islands have prospered, and now I'm seeing where the Virgin Islands have plummeted quite significantly. With the some $15 billion worth of dollars that the Virgin Islands have available, there's no way, as my brother said a long time ago, in the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. There's no way. Time. <laughs> Thank you, Julian Vera. Thank you, Mr. Vera. Ms. Charles, you're next. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa J. Charles, number 17 on the ballot. I am born in St. Croix, raised by two Antiguans, first generation Crucian. I went to the Seventh-day Adventist school all my life, never went to a public school. However, I saw fit at one point was to put my school into the seventh day, into um, the public school system. I have to work from Department of Human Services, Education, and Department of Health. I've worked at, I've, my, my passion is a senior citizen. Worked in the Medicaid office as the, the supervisor for the eligibility unit, and now currently the assistant director for the Homemakers Program for Senior Citizens Affair. Time. Thank you, Ms. Charles. We'll move over to Mr. Frederick, Hubert Frederick. Good afternoon. My name is Hubert Lorenzo Frederick. I want to thank the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc. for this opportunity and the Board of Educa Election for having hosted this event today. Um, I'm here number seven on the ballot. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm excited about this opportunity to serve. Um, my background is very simple. I'm a banker and insurance broker, businessman, born and bred on St. Croix, understands my culture, love my people. My parents are both Antiguans as well, so I love the Caribbean. I'm a Caribbean man. But whatever I could do to make St. Croix better, you could bank on me. I will be there for the people at St. Croix no one else. Only you could put me in office, so you are who I answer to, the people of St. Croix. Hubert Lorenzo Frederick, number seven on the ballot. Thank you. 
Ms. Moorhead. Hey, Ms. Moorhead is waiting for the green sand, ladies. Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. Waiting. Good afternoon. I'm the Ballot of Board of Education. The name is Mary Peggy Moorhead, number three. I've spent most of my life in education. After graduating from high school, I got a bachelor's of science degree in education. I got a master's degree in education, and then I came home in 1972 to serve as a secondary teacher in the public school system. I, after I retired and saw what was happening, I then filed that famous court, court case for the VI history. I am here because I see that the education system is in crisis and we need to have people on the Board of Education who are not only knowledgeable but courageous to do something in order to hold the department accountable. Mary Peggy Moorhead, number three, on the Board of Education ballot. Thank you, Ms. Moorhead. Ms. Peter. For Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cleopatra Peter, Dr. Peter. I, um, I was born and raised here on St. Croix, graduated from Central High, went to UVI. Then I transferred to Texas A&M University where I graduated as a software engineer. A Couple of years later, I went to massage therapy school and I completed that degree also. And then I went on to chiropractic and now I'm a chiropractor. All I ever wanted to do was return to the Virgin Islands to give great service to the people of these Virgin Islands. And I serve you guys with pride and dignity. So just understand that Dr. Peter is a doctor here in the territory if you guys have back pain or whatever. However, I noticed in the last election they may have some discrepancies in election. I believe elections need to be counted where they're cast and that's why I'm running for the Board of Election, number five on your ballot. Thank you. Thank you. So Mr. Avier, let's go back to you. As a senatorial candidate, I'll ask you the first question. What would be the first piece of legislation you would introduce if you became a senator? The first piece of legislation I would introduce is having different curriculars for our children and different level in the school system. Education is the foundation for everything in our society. And our students are being, in my opinion, being educated from the wrong point of view, I would say, for lack of a better word. So education, introducing different curriculums for different grade levels based on where our students are at as Caribbean students, as students of farmer enslaved Africans, would be my first piece of legislation. Education is our foundation. Again, Julian Vera, number 16 on your ballot, we can't do this without you. I'm asking for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Charles, you're also running for senator, correct? You're, you have the same question. What would be your first legislation you would introduce? My, thank you, that's a very good question. And you know that's the passion for, my, for where I am. It's the elderly, the senior citizens. There is no place for them to go. Herbert Gregg is, does not have enough space for them, and I believe having a facility where they can go in needs of either it be recovery from a surgery in the hospital to not having any place to go because they're going through dementia and Alzheimer's, I believe it's very important that we take care of those who had taken care of us. Being that some of us, from, some of them do not have anywhere. They do not have family members here, and so we need to take care of them. So I propose having a place for them, a safe haven, so they're not walking the streets, so they're not getting lost. Having a safe haven and a place for them to go for recovery, or at least until we can find ample, adequate place for them to rest. Thank you. Mr. Frederick, also a senator or candidate, I'm going to ask you the same question. What would be your first piece of legislation? Hubert Frederick, number seven on the ballot. 
My first piece of legislation, which is something that's already drafted, it's an initiative called the St. Croix Community Development Initiative. This particular piece of legislation will be for, specifically for the develop, development of Frederickstead and Christiansted towns. This initiative has federal support and it also has um, a funding source from investors and also it's an opportunity for our local small businesses to participate and do well with this. This initiative will transform our towns. If I'm successful to get in, I'll work with my colleagues to get the support to pass this measure immediately so we can start seeing improvement in our towns. Hubert Lorenzo Frederick, number seven on the ballot. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. Ms. Moorhead, and you, I have you running for the Board of Education. Your question is, can you describe your two top priorities to ensure the proper operation of the public schools in the VI? Your two priorities. Okay, um, there are some items on the VI code that are not being implemented by the board that appear in Title 17, Section 41. As a matter of fact, that is where uh, specifically comes the item concerning the VI history that was not implemented. There are some other courses in that same section that are not being implemented that will be important to the development of our children and of the Virgin Islands, and that's specifically the basic agriculture course, financial literacy, um, conflict resolution, and swimming and water safety. And I elected on the Board of Education would impress on the other members that we call in the Department of Education, we have subpoena power to do that, and begin to have the discussion as to the implementation of these courses, which are necessary for the development of our children. Mary Peggy Moorhead, number three on the ballot. Thank you, Ms. Moorhead. Ms. Peter, running for the Board of Election, your question is, what is, running for the Board of Election, what is a new rule or regulation or instruction that you would implement during your term to improve the election system? Again, my name is Dr. Cleopatra Peter, number five on the ballot. I think what, one of the most important things that we will ever do in our lifetime is vote. And I think when our votes are, when we vote and we believe our votes are counted, I think we're gonna have better response from our elected officials. If we think that our votes are not being counted properly, we lose trust in the system, we lose trust in our government, which leads to corruption. So I believe it's very important that we investigate and find out when was this system ever changed, because we remember when votes used to be counted where it's cast. Now it's not, so we need to investigate that and implement that. People need to know when they vote in one location, the votes are being counted at that district. No one person should be in charge of, of our votes because our votes worth more than the money you have in your bank. Our vote worth a lot of money. So we need our votes counted where it's cast and each one of our votes need to be respected. Thank you. Again, Dr. Peter, on your ballot, number five for the board of election. Thank you. Go back to Mr. Mr. Veer. Your question, your second question would be, um, Gun violence continue to remain prevalent in our community. What is one legislature step you would take to curb it? Gun violence. Mm -hmm. The first legislature step I would take to curb gun violence will be try to implement the Stop and Frisk Act. It was tried to be implemented in New York years ago, but due to the fact that most of the individuals in the states were being stopped by racist white cops. It wasn't effective. Here on the Virgin Islands, we do not have this problem. We have, most of us living here are from African descent, so I don't think we would have that issue here, as, uh, the race issue I'm speaking about. So, the Stop and Frisk Act, which would be if you stopped and uh, a gun is found in your possession, would give the authorities the right to search wherever you live or to search whatever belongings you have. Again, Julian Vera, 
number 16 on your ballot. Thank you. Ms. Charles, I heard you just mention the elderly, so let me give you this question. Okay. The cost of living in the Virgin Islands is relatively high. Utility bills, the cost of food, Medicare, medical bills, what would you do to alleviate some of that stress on our community? That's a very good question. Lisa Charles, number 17 on your ballot. Our community relies a lot on imported goods. So we need to find a way that we can actually we can actually provide those items here. That means um, factories, if we could, because we have, a, we, we have the land for it. And maybe we can have people, investors, businesses come in here, um, like I heard a senator said, that they can come in here, that involves creating jobs for our community in creating opportunities for us to get these items here even includes agriculture growing our own food growing our own eggs i mean i've i've seen so many dry places what are the first things that grows in a dry place aloes aloes can be used for a whole host of of good whether it's medicine or rum there is lots we need to be creative and getting those things out there so that's what i would say maybe partnering with other people and partnering with with organizations that are bringing in these items so that it's not as difficult maybe do incentives for them to be part of our our import so we can get those at a more reasonable price because that's what's happening. Lisa Charles, number 17 on your ballot. Thank you. So Mr. Frederick, the businessman. Let's talk. The businessman. How would you help us with WAPA? Uh, I'm just gonna call it out. How would you help us with WAPA? Hubert Lorenzo, Frederick, number seven on the ballot. Uh, my background is in finance. Uh, my degree is in accounting and finance from Florida and Florida M University, and my master's degree is in planning and economic development. I understand the economy pretty good. I, I got a good grasp on what it takes to make a successful economy work. One of the things that we need to do is get sustainable energy if you want to attract any business here, which is the biggest problem we have. We lost so many small businesses over the last seven years because of the storms that we have to recapture those businesses again. And the way you get them to come back is to have a sustainable energy source so they could have a business running and not having to deal with blackouts. Blackouts cost businesses money. When we lose money, then that's a problem. The key for WAPA is renewable energy. It's always been the key. Unfortunately, instead of us investing in renewable energy, we invested in propane gas. That was a problem. We were supposed to get a 30% reduction in our bills. It didn't happen. Had we actually used that money to, fin to finance uh, solar farms, we wouldn't be here today in this mess. Mm. So we made some fatal errors, and we're trying to correct it. We still have a long way to go. I'm glad we have new leadership. I'm prayful that this new leadership will be able to turn things around with WAPA. But 30 WAPA seconds. is everything. If we don't fix WAPA, we will not recover. I can't even be successful with my economic plans that I have in place. So let's get WAPA fixed. I will do everything in my power to make sure WAPA is fixed. You could count on that. Hubert Lorenzo Frederick, number seven on the ballot. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. Ms. Moorhead, how would you engage the community to improve public schools in the territory? How would you engage the community to improve the public school system? Okay, thank you. Mary Peggy Moorhead, number three, on the Board of Education ballot. I would definitely hold town meetings 
on particular subject areas mm -hmm. and invite the public to come in and have their comments, make their contribution, their suggestions in order for us to make sure that we're meeting the concerns that they have that would be channeled to us through from the students to the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I was there previously. I was the only member that did organize town meetings with the Board of Education and the different communities in order for us to discuss different topics. Uh, at that time, it was the devices, and I'm going to ask that we begin with a discussion on the devices again, because there have been quite some complaints that devices are causing problems where the violence is happening in our schools. Mm -hmm. And I think the parents need to have some input onto how we would deal with that because there are a dangerous situation. But we would definitely, it would need town meetings for the parents to be able to come out and have an open discussion with the board members on the particular items. And I would like to show it that uh, when I said education is in a crisis, that was by testimony of the department and the Board of Education last year in the Senate hearing. Mary Peggy Moorhead, number three on the ballot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Moorhead. Thank you. Okay, elections. So, Dr. Peter, how would you address voter apathy, particularly among the young people in the Virgin Islands? Say that again? How would you address voters' apathy, particularly among the young people in the Virgin Islands? How would you get the young people out to participate in voting? Well, again, my name is Dr. Cleopatra Peter. I am number three on the ballot. What we're doing right now is going to the communities and speaking directly to the young people. Here again is the problem. When the parents believe that the votes are, are not counted properly, the parents say it out loud and the children hear. And as a result, the children end up saying, hey, I'm not voting because I don't think the election is fair. So it's very important that we bring back integrity into the election system and the election board so that the parents can be happy with the election, whether you win or lose, and then they could mirror that to the children and the children that will look forward to voting. So understanding that elections are very, very important. If the parents are not happy, the children will not be happy. So it's very important, I believe, that votes need to be counted where it's cast. And I challenge all candidates to ask the important questions. We're talking about election, 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 but no one is talking about where are these votes being counted. We need votes counted where they're cast. Again, I'm Dr. Peter, number three on your ballot. Thank you. We're going back to Mr. Uh, Vieira. I guess my timekeepers will let me know how my time is doing, how, how we doing with time. So, Mr. Vieira, my question for you as a senator or candidate is, domestic violence is on the rise. It's one of our social ills. In the capacity of a senator, how could you help alleviate that or make changes? Okay, I'll repeat it. Domestic violence is a social ill that impacts so many people in this community. Your mic is not working? This mic, okay, I'll, I'll hold it. You okay now? Okay. Domestic violence is a social ill that impacts so many members in our community. What would you do in your capacity as a senator to alleviate this impact on the community? So we, so we have the men's coalition and we have the women's coalition. I, for quite a long time, was suggesting that we need to have a family coalition. So I would try to introduce a family coalition that would try to solve family problems, not just female problems or male problems separately. I would try to introduce a family coalition so that we can solve family problems. Julian Vera, number 16, and your ballot. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Charles, let me ask you the same question. Thank you for that question. That's like a very repeat, good question. You want me to repeat it or you? No, I'm good. When, the, the, that's, that's really tough 
because I don't know how much you could curb that, but I, I figured that if we go through how many times the police department has to be called to that particular home for that particular issue, if that is the case, then they have to go to counseling, mandating that they should go to counseling, um, men's coalition and women's coalition. And of course, including what Vier just said, family coalition. It's important that we do not ignore the signs that are there. We all see the red flags. We all know what it is. And we all should not go, that's not my business, but we should get involved because it affects us in the long run. You see something, say something. If you see, a, you see the signs of abuse in a family, you call the police. You, you, you can, you, we should do maybe a, a, a anonymous calls for domestic violence. All these things can help us deal with the violence in the family, domestic violence on a whole. A lot of people don't want to get involved. So I would say maybe a domestic violence hotline. And anytime any domestic violence and a police officer gets, gets called out to that home, it becomes mandated that they have to go through domestic violence um, counseling. And let's see if we can rectify that. This is Lisa J. Charles, number 17 on your ballot. Thank you, Ms. Charles. Mr. Frederick, I'm going to ask you the same question. Would you like me to repeat it? Domestic violence? Is the social ill in this community. How can you help alleviate it if you become a new senator? Hubert Frederick, number seven on the ballot. Um, intervention is a very important therapy that we have. Uh, the problem is we don't have the resources. Uh, human services does not have the kind of budget to hire the professionals to do what's needed. If we're gonna get serious about a lot of these ills, we gotta fund them. One of the ways we have to fund these things is by identifying a funding source. And right now we're looking for sources to just fund anything because there's, there's no more opportunities to, to find money. So we have to grow our economy. And that's why I said, let's, let's start focusing on getting some money first so we can start implementing more programs that will assist our, pro our families whenever they run into issues like these. These are social problems that will be here forever. They were here when we were kids, they'll be here after we die. So why don't we do this the right way? Get the money in place, hire the proper professionals that we need, get the resources we need, the facilities, and then see what happens from that point. But we have been doing this piecemeal, piecemeal, piecemeal since I've been here for the 20 years. And I keep saying, why don't we just do it the right way, comprehensively, let's plan. We never plan anything. These problems that's popping up have been here and they're not gonna go away like that. We have squabbles in families that should have been resolved years ago. That's why we have so many abandoned houses here too. Families can't even agree who owns the property anymore. 30 seconds. So let's focus on things like money that we need to get to fund these intervention programs to get these families the therapy they need to get better. Thank you so much, Hubert Frederick, number seven on the ballot. Thank you. Ms. Moorhead. There is quite a bit of violence in the schools. As a going back board member, because you were a previous board member to the uh, Board of Education, what would you do or how can you help the continuing bullying in the school, the continuing violence in the school, the continuing child abuse that's not being reported in the school? What would you do as a board member to address those issues? Okay. Well, there were several things that uh, was established in the past that would did not continue. For one, as I pointed out back in the 80s, when we first began to see violence in the school was when there was established a conflict resolution program. Uh, that needs to be back in the curriculum, for one, in order to teach young people how to deal with conflicts without getting into the violence. The uh, other thing that needs to happen is the department is not very open to volunteers in the schools. And I know this for a fact because last September, I filled out an application to be a volunteer. I have not received a response yet, okay? And my position is, 
If we can get volunteers, so people just do with everything, sit in the school, maybe an hour or two a day, uh, additional adults in the facility would be a determinant to the children from being, uh, getting themselves invo involved in violence. The other thing is uh, I would advocate and have been doing so for us to have psychologists on site, psychologists or social worker on site in the school uh, available because sometimes students have concerns, have problems, but they don't have anyone to discuss it with. And please don't tell me about school counselors. I know about them. They're not necessarily that confidential. We need someone who knows and understands how to keep matters private when they're supposed to be private and who are properly trained to deal seconds. with those particular incidents. Uh, there, I'll stop there, but there are quite a few things that, yes, can be done, that our Board of Education has the authority and duty to do mm -hmm. that they're not doing presently. Mary Peggy Moorhead, number three on the Board of Education. Thank you, Ms. Moorhead. <laughs> Dr. Peters, how would, um, what is the one aspect of the election system that you would envision changing, or if you have a couple of things you would change if you got elected, what would they be? Again, my name is Dr. Cleopatra Peter. Mm -hmm. I'm number five on the ballot. Again, y'all will notice I'm echoing the same thing over and over and over. I'm a doctor and chiropractor here in the Virgin Islands. I don't want to run for the Board of Election. The reason why I think I'm running is because I see a problem here. Votes are not being counted where they cast. So for the past two, elect two years, I've been echoing this same sentence over and over and over. And it should be everybody's concern. Again, your vote means money. Your vote, if, if your votes are not counted how it's supposed to be cast, that means the wrong person is in office. When the wrong person is in office, they're not obligated to you. They're obligated to whoever put them in there. So that's why it's very important for us to understand elections, we need integrity, accountability. We need to have, in, again, integrity and honesty and transparency when it comes to election because elections have consequences. And again, one of the first and only thing I really care about here is votes to be counted where it's cast. I really don't care who win. Whoever win, great. But I need votes to be counted where they cast and honor the votes and respect the votes. What you will, the one most important thing you will do in this lifetime is to vote. You are the one directing where your country or your, your, your island is going. When we feel that votes are not being respected, seconds. Votes are, that means your country is going in the opposite direction. So I think that we all need to be aware to be open-minded and understand. If your votes are not counted where they cast, your country, your money is going in the opposite direction, which leads to corruption, and uh, the, the government just doesn't care. So understand the reason why I keep saying this thing over and over. I want to go back to treating people. I want to get out of election, but I got to do this first Time. to get back in. Votes need to be counted where they cast. My name is Dr. Peter, number five on the ballot. Okay, thank you. Last question before we go into your closing. And I'm going to ask everybody on the panel the same last question. Why should we trust you for this position you're seeking? Starting with you, Mr. Vieira. Well, let me say I'm a Rastafarian. That's why you should trust me. Because our understanding is, I'm sure you all have heard this, I and I. Yes. The I and I means that I see myself the same way I see you. So there is no second person where we say I and I. So if with this understanding, I'm going into the Senate. It's an ancient African understanding, which comes from a word means Ubuntu. It means I can't be okay unless all of us are okay. So this is the understanding that I'm bringing to the Senate. I can't get $85,000 a year, and other individuals in our community makes twenty seven. So I am coming with this into the Senate with the understanding of I and I. I don't see any second person. I see everyone the same way I see myself. Julian Vera, number 16 on your ballot. Thank you. Ms. Charles. 
Good afternoon again. My name is Lisa J. Charles. I am number 17 on your ballot. Why should you trust me? I see everyone in here as my mother, my grandmother, my sister, my son, my daughter. You see where I'm coming from? There is no special place for anybody other than I treat you the exact way I would treat my mother and my family. I don't do it because I know you. A stranger will get the same response from me. I deal with you the same way I would somebody special in my life. I wear my, my emotions on my sleeves. That could be a good or a bad. What you see is what you get. I don't know any other way. What you see is what you get. I extend myself regardless. I'm a person, I believe, if I don't know, I can find the resources for you. I will direct you to where you go. Anyone who's working for the public community should be able to assist you and direct you in those paths. I worked for Medicaid. I am the woman that is known during the D-SNAP time, the lady under the tent. 30 seconds. The lady under the tent. I come in, you come into Medicaid office, I am the one that's going to come out into the lobby and help you, regardless if it's SNAP or Medicaid. I am the lady that's going to come out when you come to the senior citizens affairs office that's going to step out of that office and walk you over to assist you. I believe in taking care of our time. Our, again, I'm Lisa J. Charles, number 17 on your ballot. Thank you, Ms. Charles. Mr. Frederick, the same question. Why should we trust you? Hubert Frederick, number seven on the ballot. This one is very simple for me because I've dedicated my entire life for service. At the age of 21, I enlisted in the Navy. I was willing to give my life for every single person here. I didn't even think twice about it. It's something I wanted to do. You could trust the fact that if I'm willing to give my life for you, I'm willing to serve you without any question, without any need to question whether or not I'll do something improper. I'm a certified fraud examiner. I've been one for 27 years. I've been a banker for 25 years. The scrutiny that you have to go through to be a banker, to be a certified uh, fraud examiner, it's intense. I've been uh, vetted by the United States Navy. So I think I've, I've been tested pretty good. And during that time, I've never gotten in trouble. Never have, never will. I've got a business here for the last 15 years. I've got employees that I support that I have to make sure that their families are taken care of every two weeks. I've paid every taxes that it, that's been due. Um, I'm just one of those do-gooders. I do everything I'm supposed to do because I understand the consequences when you don't. My parents taught me to always be responsible. You should trust me because that's what I've done. I've got the record to prove that I'm trustworthy. To be uh, an insurance broker, an insurance agent, one of the questions they ask seconds. you is whether or not you are trustworthy. That is something I've done for over 20 years. So I feel comfortable with that word trust. Um, I'm not motivated by anyone's money. I've got enough for myself. I've taken care of myself. So I could focus on the people of St. Croix, the people of the Virgin Islands. Hubert Frederick, number seven on the ballot. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. Ms. Moorhead? Same, Same question? question? Mm -hmm. I'm Why not about to give my life for anyone, and I don't have enough money. Uh, that's for sure. But, <laughs> but okay. one thing I will say is I believe knowledge is power, and then whatever I know I share, I tell the truth all the time, uh, regardless of who, regardless of the position, regardless of who they are, where they are. And anyone who knows me will tell you that is a fact. Uh, I do believe that there's too many leaders who don't tell the truth and who keep the people ignorant and deprive them of knowing their rights. And that's one of the basic 
problems that I have with the Board of Education, who is sitting watching the education system deteriorate and make him believe they don't have the power to make a change. And if anything you walk away from today, believe me when I tell you Title 17 has given the Board of Education power that they should be holding the department accountable every step of the way and they haven't done it once yet and you who have children or don't have children should be demanding that. Okay. I, I'm not looking for popularity, I'm just looking for respect and if that is enough, you can trust me all the time. Okay, <laughs> we you. focus Peggy in, Moorhead, number three. Right, we focus on you. Thank you, Ms. Moorhead. Dr. Peter, the same question, why should we trust you? Again, my name is Dr. Cleopatra Peter. I'm number five on the ballot. I worked in, in America for many years as a chiropractor, and all I ever wanted to do was, was come home. Every time I would treat other races, they would always say how much they love Dr. Peter. And every time they said that, I took a step backwards. Every time they proclaim and say how much they love me, I took a step backwards. And every time I took a step backwards, what I would say in my mind is, what if I could touch my own? They would love me more. And I would cry just to come home. I would call my friends and tell them what do they think. And they all told me, come home. I couldn't wait the day to come home and open my own office and treat you guys how I was treating other races. I love the people of the Virgin Island. I love the people of St. Croix. And I treat you guys with pride and dignity. I give to you guys what I learned. I went to school and I learned the best I could learn. I didn't have a boyfriend at the time. I made sure I focused on what I learned. And when I graduated, I have a lot of skills. I have a lot of knowledge. I do a lot of research. And that's what I came here for. I did not come here to be in politics. Somehow politics called my name. And I'm here today to tell you I'm number five on the ballot for the Board of Election. I just want a healthy system. The same way we need a healthy body, we need a healthy election system so that we could have a healthy government, so we could have a healthy legislature. We have to understand that we serve in the people, even me as a doctor. I come here to serve you. I ain't no better than seconds. you. I am not better than you. I am a servant that come here to serve you with pride and dignity. The election system is the same thing. You guys are here to serve the people of the Virgin Islands. The legislature is here to serve the people of the Virgin Islands. The government and the governor is here to serve the people of the Virgin Islands. I'm here to serve the people of the Virgin Islands. I'm honest. I'm here to serve you. Vote Dr. Peter, Dr. Peter all the way on election day, number five. Thank you very much. So we'll go into the very last segment at the end where we will ask each candidate, you have uh, one minute to tell us why we should vote for you. And we'll start with Mr. Vieira again. This is your last chance to let the people know why you Good afternoon again, family. Julian Vieira, number 16 on your ballot. The Virgin Islands is a serious crossroad. We need to understand that now it's very important to put different guards in place so that we can lead the Virgin Islands into a better direction. Again, I would say I'm Rastafarian. I've been Rastafarian for now 35 years. And my understanding is that we need to stick to equal rights and justice. As I mentioned before, I and I is very important. We need to see each other as we see ourselves. And that is what is lacking in our community. So along with that, I bring 35 years of small business knowledge to the Senate. And again, I bring about 20 years of government investigation, good, good government and bad government investigation from around the world and in the Virgin Islands. And the only way... Time. Again. Julian Vera, number 16 on your ballot. I give thanks. Mr. Charles. Lisa J. Charles, number 17 on your ballot. I vied for running for Senate. I've worked over 23 years in the government from Department of Education, Department of Health, Department of Human Services, and even private institutions. I've even worked in customer service. No one knows customer service more than I do. My platform is for our youths, our quality of living for our seniors, health insurance, 
and none other than mental health. Mental health doesn't mean crazy people. Mental health does not mean crazy people. We all need mental health because at some point we must find a way to help cope with whatever is going on in our lives. May it be personal Time. or not. My name is Lisa J. Charles, number 17 on your ballot. Thank you, Ms. Charles. We move to Mr. Frederick, your closing. Hubert Frederick, number seven on the ballot. I'm probably one of the easiest choices you need to make for three reasons. Number one, I'm a financial expert, and you guys know we have $15 billion that we need to make sure we manage this opportunity correctly, or it will not be transformational as it can be and as it should be. Secondly, I was a former deputy commissioner of health. I've got a healthcare background I was the mental health uh, director for over a year. I understand the issues we have with healthcare. Let me develop a comprehensive healthcare plan with the $900 million we have coming to us. This is something that we could do if we plan and use my expertise. It's not costing a whole lot. And lastly, um, we have to focus on economics. The economy is important. I've got a plan in place that could turn around our towns. Let me have the opportunity to show you that we could do it. This is not a guess, this is just facts. Hubert Frederick, number seven on the ballot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. Ms. Moorhead? The most important foundation for economic growth is a good education. I believe, and I've always fight, for there to be a quality education, a public education system. And I note I say quality education. We must always make sure you put that in word in the front of education because we have an education system, it's just not of the best quality. And I will fight to bring the heads together with the Board of Education, the Career Board, the University of the Virgin Islands, and the Department of Education to sit and work together to upgrade and improve the public education system, curriculum, and instruction for the territory. Mary Peggy Moorhead, number three on the ballot with the Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Peters, close it out. Again, my name is Dr. Cleopatra Peter. I'm number five on the ballot for the Board of Election. I believe that St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Island, is the best piece of land in the world. I honestly believe that. And I believe that the federal government is sending billions of dollars here in these territories. Unlike places like St. Lucia that don't get that kind of money, you see the economic place is just booming. We need to have better management, and it stems again from the election system and the election board. That is my biggest thing. If we could have free and fair elections here in these Virgin Islands, I believe the right people are going to get elected. The right people are know they're going to go in. They know that the people voted them in, and they better do right by the people or they got to go. And with that, I think we'll have more accountability, we'll have more transparency, we'll have more honesty in the system. And I believe the Virgin Islands could be a better place for the world to see. I think we are in the best place in Time. the world. Thank you, guys. My name again is Dr. Peter, number five on the Board of Election. Thank, thank you. you. So, thank you. I would like to take this time to thank all the candidates. Please give them a round of applause. I would like to thank the election system of the Virgin Islands with special thanks to Supervisor Carol, Dr. Carolyn Fox. I would like to thank the Government Assets Channel, particularly Earl Morris. Thank you, Earl. I would like to thank DJ Swan, who assisted with the live streaming and all the sounding. I would like to thank our timekeepers, my sorors Kim Jerome and Sora Manifa McIntosh. I would like to thank the entire Social Action Committee, which I'm not going to name all the names. Uh, the chair is Santa Joseph, who's not here, but who sat in for her was Soro Elizabeth Torriel. I would like to thank her for stepping up. I would like to give a special thanks to our president, Soro Petra Victor, and the audience that keep us on task. And I would like to thank all the Deltas who came out, and all the audience who came out to educate themselves, to learn about the candidates. Thank everybody in the audience for coming out. We will, the next event we will be doing would be, 
I would like to recognize delegate to Congress, uh, Donna Green, sorry, I didn't see you. Delegate to Congress, former delegate to Congress, Donna Green, Christensen, welcome and thank you for being here. We appreciate you. And last of all, voters registration, our next voters registration assistant, because all we do is assist, again, we're non-party. We're just the middle ground, we set it up. We will be helping with voter registration on October the 5th. It costs you less from 12 to 3. So if you didn't get a chance to uh, register or educate people, please come out. Thank you again for being here. Educating ourselves is what it's all about. Know yourself. Thank you very much.